So I'll give you all a couple minutes, a minute or two to join in. I am going to share this. Let's see. There we go. All right. I'm just going to get this ready. Um, all right. Just getting this set up. For people that want to watch live. So I have some people that watch live that don't come into the Zoom room. So okay. You know what? I'm just we're gonna do this next time. There we go. Set that up. Okay. Welcome everyone. I see people coming in. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to do this a little different than we have other times. And so I'm going to walk you through something as well, but you should have started to get the, the um, trainings, the, so the six day training. So you, it walks you through a lot of what we have been talking about on these calls. And so I want you to have all of that so you can go back to it and use it and then bring any questions that you have to these calls and we can start to talk through any questions that you do have. So today I am going to talk about how to really decide how you want to eat in a way that serves you. And it will be very similar to the training that you will get to the, the video that you will get along with the worksheets. And so I'm not going to spend maybe as much time talking about it in that way because you have that. And so I want to really answer any questions that you have for me and anything that's going on for you. So, sorry, just has a, oh, there we go. Okay. So first I want to answer, um, so Claire, Hello, I see you here. You had sent me a question, and so I'll just read your question and then give you give you my response before we dive in. So, and I'll take a step back because I know I have I see many new people here that haven't been here before and we haven't talked before. So if you have a question, what I want you to do is in the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q and A, and you type your question and it'll just come to me and then I will respond and we can and we can talk about it. If you would like to be coached, like actually come on and have a two-way conversation. You can hit your little virtual raise your hand button and then we will go through that that way. So, um, so how this works, if you haven't been here before, is I'm going to, I'll answer any of your questions as we go through. So you don't have to wait till the end or anything. Just type in any question that you have and then I will start responding to those and then I will walk you through something and share with you something that you can start implementing in your own life today to start to really make the changes for yourself. And so first I'm gonna start by answering Claire's question. So Claire sent me a note that said, I would be interested to hear your views on managing low level hunger at bedtime. I find it hard to sleep with low level hunger, but I don't want to eat as I know my body is thriving on being able to slowly burn fat. I've tried chamomile tea and meditation. Is this something that improves as we adapt? So Claire, this is something that I would ask yourself a couple of questions. And so when I think about going to bed in particular and going to bed with some hunger, it depends on kind of your hunger. So you kind of indicated that it sounds like it's low level hunger. And so for me, like I love going to bed with like a little tinge of hunger, like not like, oh my gosh, I need to eat, but I, I genuinely don't enjoy going to bed feeling full or feeling like I have a very full stomach just because of how I wake up in the morning. I feel like I don't sleep as well. And then I feel a little bloated in the morning and I don't like, eliminate as quickly all of the things. So I really like to go to bed with a tinge of hunger. And now what I want you to ask yourself is when you get hungry, what comes up for you? Like, what are all of your thoughts? I think we're so used to feeling like we need to eat all of the time, especially for those of us that have dieted or have done some of the traditional programming. We can be used to diets that are like, okay, you have to eat every like two hours. And so like, if you're anything like I was, like I didn't really know what hunger was in the beginning. I didn't really know what that felt like. And so ask yourself like, what's, is the problem with me feeling hungry? 
Like there's something in your, that your brain is kind of offering up to is like, there, it feels uncomfortable. There's something about it that you don't like. There's something that your, your mind might associate sleep with, with uh, fullness. So I actually have a client that is like so deeply entrenched in her that like she, she really believes, especially when we started working together, that like, I need to go to bed on a full stomach. It was something that she had in her childhood. It was something that just felt like so comfortable and familiar to her. And I think it can for so many of us, for many reasons, partially because, and if you have any comments as I'm answering this, feel free to, to put them in that, that, um, and for those of you that just joined, um, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So put your questions there and I'm more than happy to answer them as we go, as we go through all of this. And I want to really use this as the time to answer those questions for you. And then I'll walk you through uh, what we wanted to talk about today of how to eat in a way that serves you. But back to your question, Claire, of how do you feel with that hunger, like ask yourself, like what's happening for you? Where do you feel it in your body? Why does it feel like it's something that you need to distract yourself with tea or meditation, right? And there's nothing wrong with like tea or meditation or going for a walk or watching TV or anything like that. But if it's coming from the place of trying to distract yourself from being with yourself, then that's where we just wanna take a look and really use your model to see like, okay, why is this uncomfortable for me? Why is this a problem for me? And over time, then as you, let's say you go to bed in the evening, you're like, I like had a tinge of hunger, partially because our body starts to send us hunger cues a lot of times associated with our clock. And so you will see this in day three of the six day training where I talk about hormones that our body will start to send us a hunger cue, let's say at eight o'clock, because it's used to you eating at eight o'clock. Right, I can hear my earrings stinging on here. So it's used to you eating then. And so it'll be like, okay, it's like time to eat. Remember, this is like what we do every night. So if you've been doing this for years or decades or kind of your whole life, your body's going to be like, what? Why aren't we eating? This is just what we always do. And so part of it can be just the unfamiliarity of it, the change of it. And then part of it can be your body just kind of getting used to a new way of being and a new way of eating. And the other thing is then in the morning, so let's say you do go to bed with that low level hunger, then in the morning, ask yourself how you feel. Like, how do you feel in the morning after that? And like, for me, when I go to bed with a little bit of hunger, like I wake up in the morning, like I just feel lighter and airier and not bloated and like all of the things and I love feeling that way. So then it's like reiterating in your mind, like, oh, this is how I feel in the morning and like how powerful that is to like you were solidifying that memory and that experience for yourself so that the next time you feel a little low love for hunger and your brain is like let's eat we got to eat all the things like remember how we feel in the morning when we don't and it's amazing and that's not to say you want to like deprive yourself and go to bed like super super hungry by any means but you want to just see like what starts to feel really good and natural in your body Clara said, okay, I've been trying to get rid of it really rather than acknowledging it and accepting it and being with it. Yeah, I think so much of the, sorry, let me, I'll answer that in one sec, Claire. So, Vienna, are we muted? I don't see the mute button. So, yes, so this is different from like a, a group call. So it's a group call in the sense there's many of us on here, but no one can hear you or see you um, you can only hear and see me. So the only way that anyone else will hear you or see you is if you hit the raise your hand button and I would promote you to a panelist and we would have a two-way conversation. So no one can hear you or see you. So don't worry if you're like doing other things or you have things in the background. Like the only thing anyone else can see is if you hit the chat button, everyone will be able to see that. And if you hit the Q&A button like you did, Leanna, only I can see that. So um so when you yeah claire when you are saying rather i'm not acknowledging it and accepting it and being being with it i like to think of hunger as like i'm a really good friend with hunger like in a way that's like i can be with it we have a great relationship and i don't ignore it and like completely try to get rid of it in the way uh, that i think of like a like a two hour eating window. Like I had a, a woman come to me and she's like, I'm doing really good, I have this two hour eating window and that's all I eat like during the week and then on the weekend of course she binged because it was really hard for her to stick to. So it's not like we're trying to ignore our hunger, 
but think about it in a way of like, how can I make friends with my hunger? How can I be in my body and experience hunger in a way that it doesn't feel like I have to answer it all the time? It doesn't feel like it has this power and this control over me. Because then the other amazing thing that happens is like, you can be hungry and it's no big deal. You can be hungry and feel that physical sensation in your body and your urge isn't like, well, I have to eat this, I have to eat right now. Like for me, when I started this, like I was so detached from feeling the physical sensation of hunger that when I did feel it, I was like, I'm not sure what to do with this. We should probably eat. And so, but when we can be okay with hunger, and that's why I think it's really important to use the hunger scale, which I'll talk about a little more in a minute of like, how hungry am I on a scale of one to 10? And if I'm not kind of at my ideal number, which like for me is a seven or an eight, if I'm not there, then what is kind of my problem with being hungry? And most of the time, the problem is like, we don't know what to do with ourselves. We might have a little bit of restlessness or a little bit of uncertainty, or there might be some kind of emotion we're trying to escape. And that's often why we want to eat. But if we're okay with being hungry and not always answering it, and sometimes answering it when you do have that low level hunger, but just seeing it from a place in a way that serves you and making sure that it's not from a place that it feels like you have the compulsion to do it, where it feels like I have no other option than to eat. So I hope that answered your question. Oh, so I see you said, thank you. I've been feeling brighter in the mornings. Yeah. It's like when I started waking up in the morning, feeling like lights and not bloated and like all of the things I was like what like this is amazing like it just changed the whole way that I really thought about myself and being in my body so I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of how to decide how to eat in a way that serves you so last week we talked about really processing through a lot of that emotion and so what I decided for all of you um, that have just come in that I created a six day video training to walk you through some of the primary tools that I use with my clients so that you can start implementing them in your own life and then you can bring them to these calls and ask any questions you have. So if you have a question, type it in the Q&A box and I will answer all of your questions as we go through this. So again, so this is day, um, day two of the training, I'm like trying to remember what date it is. So you should have all gotten this already. So I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit and answer your questions, but just so you know, like you do already have this. So I like to think about deciding what to eat in a way that serves you. So not deciding what you should, what you want to eat from like, well, I have to eat this and I can't eat this and this is bad and this is good because all of that does is causes our brain to rebel and push against what we've kind of been told we need to eat. And this is what happens for so many of us on a diet, right? We're like, okay, this is it. This is, all, this is what I'm going to do. We're going to do all the things. And so we will start to like follow the book or the program or whatever, right? We, we have seen in front of us, but our brain then eventually gets to the point that it's like, I don't want to do this. I hate that someone else is telling me what to do. And it starts to rebel against it. And then that's when we get to the like, screw it, F it, all of that sort of talk that we tell ourselves. And the other thing that happens is when we have like, I think of like a traditional diet of like, here are all the things you can eat, here are all of the things you can't eat. And it's a very prescriptive, this is good, this is bad or you have to count calories, or you like count your sins, like I think that's something that we count sins, um, or you count points or whatever it is, that then it creates in our mind this obsession with food. Like when you think about yourself on any diet, how often are you thinking about food? For most of us, it's like all the time. And think about for even a child, like when you tell a child they can't have something, that's all they think about. When you tell yourself you can't have the ice cream in the freezer, what does your brain think about? The ice cream in the freezer. Because our brains are hardwired to, um, I'm sorry, I'm just fixing, because our brains are hardwired to see like threats in our life. And so even when we think back to like thousands of years ago, right? Like we may have seen a threat of like food being taken away from us and our brain was like, I need that, I need that, I need that. But like in today's age, when we think about how our brain thinks about food, it still sees it as like a life-threatening threat. And so that is why our brain will loop on it. But that is not serving us today because we have no scarcity of food. Like I love to think about, it's 
as far as like giving ourselves some compassion and understanding why we do that, like, so I have a grandmother who is, so she's 99. And so I think about like, she lived through food rationing. She lived through the Great Depression. She lived through a legitimate time in her life when food was actually scarce. I think sometimes we forget because of how we live today that like food was scarce for human beings not that long ago. Like in the history of humanity, food's been scarce like 99.9% .9 of the time. So then we've learned like all the way for most of us as children, like we have to clean our plate. We, you know, we have to eat all of the things. We, we need to not waste food. And so the way we've been programmed and conditioned is to have this kind of scarcity, like fear around food. But all of that does is fuel our desire for food. And so then I think when we can understand it from that perspective, we can give ourselves some grace and compassion that it's like, of course, that's what my brain is doing. And then you pile dieting on top of that. And it's like, we've created this brain that constantly thinks about food all of the time. So we're going to change how we think about it. So instead of saying anything is bad or anything is good and I can't have this and I can only have this, we're just going to say there's food. All food is neutral. And when we talk about using the model, like when we put food in our circumstance line, we have thoughts about it and that's what creates our feeling towards it. And so if we think about all food is neutral, I just want you to start to ask yourself, is this serving me? And we're going to change that conversation by asking ourselves that instead of saying, well, this is bad and this is good and I can't have this and this has too many calories, and this is too fattening, all of the things. So when your brain is going to continue to offer those up to you, kind of the, the usual way, the most familiar way that you've been thinking, but I want you to just start to question it. I think sometimes the thought of like, this has a lot of calories doesn't feel like that's something that we can question. It doesn't feel like that's something I don't have to like latch on to and like believe and fear. And so like now for myself, like I never think about calories. Like that doesn't really even cross my mind. It's just, is this going to serve me or is it not going to serve me? And here are some things I want you to ask yourself. So here's how you know if it serves you or not. I'm going to move this back just a little so you can see the bottom. So how we're getting, and I'm going to walk you through kind of my example for myself, is how do I know it serves me? Is you're going to ask yourself, is what I'm doing sustainable? Is what I've just, how I've decided to eat sustainable? Is it something I can do for the rest of my life? Not necessarily that you're going to do it for the rest of your life. You're for sure not going to eat the same thing every single day for the rest of your life. But is it something I could see myself doing permanently? We don't want to make these changes from a place of like, I need to do it and I need to do it really quick so that I can get to my goal. And then I can like back off. We want to do everything from a place that it's like, I could totally do this. And it then creates a couple of things for us. It creates... The, our brain's kind of immediate reaction to rebel starts to go away because we're like, it's something I can do. I've decided. And also the process is so much more enjoyable that when we get to our goal weight, when we really become naturally thin, it just becomes a part of who we are. It's not something we're doing. I think so often we're so used to like, well, I need to do this and do this and do this, and then I'll get there. But instead of thinking of like, is this something I could do forever? You start to live into that version of you that doesn't think about food all the time. You start to live into that version of you that can go to bed with some low level hunger and it's not a big deal. It doesn't even cross your mind that you need to eat. Like we start to live into that all along the way so that then when you do get there, then when you inevitably do reach your goal weight, it's just like, it's kind of like, of course, like, of course, this is me. Of course, this is me and my body because you've been practicing it all along the way. And so you're going to ask yourself, is it sustainable? Is it helping me reach my goal, right? So we're not going to say, well, I'm just going to eat whatever I want forever. And that serves me. And maybe it does. But if you have a goal to lose weight, you're also going to ask yourself, is this helping me reach my goal? What are my goals? Is it to think about food less? Is it to be more fat adapted? Is it to, right? Like ask yourself, what are your goals? And then ask yourself, like, how does it feel in my body? Like, does it feel good in my body? This is one of the, the, the questions I ask myself all of the time. Okay. Like, 
how does that food feel in my body? Like, how does, how do I really feel when I eat that? So for example, for me, dairy feels terrible in my body. Like it feels really not good at all. And I have no desire for it. Not because I told myself I can't have it. And here's the difference. I used to tell myself I can't have it. So I was vegan for several years. And I was like a, a gluten-free, non-box, make everything from scratch vegan. Still struggled with my weight. And so that was one of the times I'm like, okay, clearly it's my mind. It's not like the diet. And I used to tell myself, like, I can't have dairy. I can't have dairy. I can't have dairy. But then what really shifted for me was that I started to just ask myself, like, why? Why am I telling myself I can't have this? And I sort of intellectually knew it didn't feel good in my body, but when I really started to see how it felt, sorry, let me just move this. When I really started to see how it felt in my body, that's when the desire for it went away because I would eat it, I would feel constipated, I would feel bloated, I would start to get a headache, and I would be like, oh yeah, remember, like that doesn't feel good. And then it would be a couple of months maybe would go by and we'd be at a restaurant and my husband loves cheesecake and dairy feels fine for him. And so I would have a couple of bites of it, like it's fine, it's no big deal right? Like I can have whatever I want, but then I would eat it and feel like complete ass for like a day. I'm like, not kidding you. Sometimes it was like almost two days. Like my body just really doesn't feel good with dairy. And so I then from that place, it was never, I can't have it. It was just like, it just doesn't serve me. It doesn't feel good for me. So not saying you have to do that with like a entire food group, but just keep checking in with yourself and asking yourself. And you start to develop this skill and this amazing awareness of what serves you and what serves your body. And when I think about changing how we think about the way we eat, it is that skill that then we get to take with us for the rest of our life. It's that skill then that we don't have to be like, oh, well, this is the only way I can eat because this is the only way I know how to lose weight. It's no, I just have a different relationship with food. I think about food in a different way. So what I might be eating might change, but how I think about it is what stays the same. So then the last two are, do I enjoy eating it? Actually, like, I think this is really important and I'll walk you through some things on kind of my, how I eat food list of like, do I enjoy eating it? Like, I don't think it serves a purpose to eat something that you hate eating. Like it, there, you might be able to do it for a little bit of time, but your brain's gonna be like, absolutely not. So for example, I drink a green smoothie every morning. I love drinking it because I feel amazing afterwards. I mean, is it like the most pleasant thing? No, but there's fruit in it. And I do thoroughly like enjoy the taste. Now, am I like dying to drink it every morning? No, but it just serves me in the way I feel. I enjoy eating it because of how I feel and because of um, what it does for me. And so then the last thing is, I like to just, you'll hear me like talk a decent bit about like kids. I like to, I like to think about like kids and then sometimes dying on the other side of like that spectrum and that part of our life in that, what do I think about this for children? And so you ask yourself when you're eating, like, what would I think about this for my children? And so for me, I drink tea, black tea with coconut cream in the morning. Now, would I give that to my children? Like I probably have like three or four cups, probably not. And so like, it's not like, oh, like I, I need to eat in the same way. Like I would have my kids eat, but I love it. It serves me. It doesn't, I feel great after it. It doesn't get in the way of like me reaching my goals. It's, I still then don't really eat much else in the morning. Like if there, I have zero problem with it. Right. But would I give my son three cups of black tea? Probably not. But when I have him, he does sometimes drink it. So yes, of course. For me, if there is something for me that I find myself eating that I would never give to my children, that is just like an indication for me of like, hmm, I wonder why then do I think it serves me? And it might, but just asking yourself these questions. So I'm going to walk you through something I want you to do. So there's a couple things I want you to do. And I want you to really think about this and think about this as just, it's an iterative, iterative process. It's not just like a one and done forever. And so in the video training you will have gotten from the emails, there are worksheets to help you with like your food planning and thinking about how you want to eat. And I don't want you to think about it in this like really stringent way, but how I want you to think about it and start with 
like this is going to be shorter than what you're going to do just because I didn't want to like have like 20 pages of this, but I want you to just get out two sheets of paper, one food that serves me, one food that doesn't serve me, and just start to ask yourself some of those questions and start to really think about what food serves me, what food doesn't serve me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to go to... Okay, so if you have, just clicking through some of the questions. So if you have any questions, again, I see a couple people join after you can hit, there's a Q and A box button. That was like button and box combined. There's a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen that you can type in your question and I will give you an answer and we can kind of work through that. So when I think about food that serves me and food that doesn't serve me, you want to ask yourself your questions and write down as many things as you can think about. And this isn't permanent, but it's just to start to get in the habit of it. <clears throat> and so like, if you think about like writing out vegetables, I want you to write out like, what are all the vegetables that serve you? What are the ones that don't? Fruit, what are all the fruits that serve you? What are all the fruits that don't? And like the only thing we actually need to survive is vegetables, fat, and water. And so that is not to say that is all you should eat. Like that is for sure not all I eat. And I think it doesn't serve me to think about it that way because as soon as I do, I can like feel myself being like, Ugh, like kind of like restricted. I'm like, no, like again, like there's just food and I pick and choose what serves me and what doesn't serve me. So I'm going to walk you through for me and you'll see kind of how brief this is as far as like the food that's available. So the food that serves me, like even right now, this is different than what it was a couple of years ago or what it was even for sure when I was pregnant. So food that serves me, sweet potatoes, kale, I drink a green smoothie every morning, gluten-free bread, eggs, tea with coconut cream, carrots, parsnips, vegetables, fruit. And so like I said, like I didn't like list out all of the fruit that serves me and all of the fruit that doesn't. Coconut oil, kombucha, water, Make sure water on your list of food that serves you. I know we can intellectually know that we need to drink water, but it's so important for us to start to develop that habit. So, and then the food that doesn't serve me is gluten in general. Like again, my body just doesn't respond well. And also my daughter, I'm breastfeeding. When I eat gluten, I can tell she has like a skin reaction to it. So I'm like, no problem. Don't need any gluten, it doesn't serve me. Fried food, so like Brussels sprouts. I actually genuinely love the taste of Brussels sprouts. And I don't know what it is. There are certain things with certain cabbages and, and things like Brussels sprouts that for some people, like their digestive system doesn't handle it well. And I am one. And I like love, love Brussels sprouts. I mean, anytime my husband and I would go out to eat, always get Brussels sprouts. And both of us have noticed we don't feel good afterwards, like always. And I mean, I've probably eaten at Brussels sprouts a hundred times and been like, uh-uh. Mm -mm, I really like them. But now I've just gotten to the place that I'm just like, it's just not worth it. So this doesn't serve me food. It's not like, oh, everything that's like high calorie or high fat. Like I don't even think about it in that way. I just think about like what serves me and what doesn't serve me. And this can be things that maybe are like quote unquote healthy. So I even want you to get out of the like, well, this is healthy. This is unhealthy. So dairy, like I mentioned, quinoa. So quinoa and salmon, right? Like if you, all, most diet books or most kind of programs and talk about how amazing quinoa is because it's not a grain, it's a protein. How amazing salmon is because of all of the omega fatty acids in it, right? Like both of those you would hear in like, the majority of a lot of diet programs and other programs, how amazing they are. But guess what? I really don't like the way quinoa tastes. I've tried and tried and tried. I just don't like it. So like, it doesn't serve me because I'm not gonna make myself eat something I don't enjoy eating. And the other thing with salmon, I used to love salmon. I ate it once when I was pregnant and like, I don't know, it's like something switched in me and I'm like, absolutely not. Like even the thought of smelling it, I'm just like, Ugh. like I just, so, no, no part of me wants it. So I'm not gonna like try to force myself to eat salmon because I don't genuinely enjoy it. Like no part of me wants to. 
pasta, even gluten-free pasta for me, it just doesn't feel good in my body. There's certain nuts that don't feel good. So like pistachios for me feel totally fine in certain ways that nuts are prepared. Like I can tell my body, it doesn't serve me. And so this is something that you're constantly asking yourself. It's not like a one and done. And then um, the other thing is like chicken breasts, like same with salmon. I'm just like, I just gross. Like there's something about white meat that I just like, mm, that's a no. And it just like, I, so I have no desire for it, right? And I know some people that love eating white meat, love eating chicken breast, right? And so this can be any way of eating that you want. And so I work with clients that are anywhere from vegan to keto to nothing at all, kind of no, they don't follow any sort of like lifestyle, I would say. Like vegan is a very um, specific way of living and a way of thinking that is oftentimes much more about like, well, I just can't eat meat, right? So this can be for anything. And this is, I have done like ever since I was vegan. So ask yourself like what food serves me, what food doesn't serve me. And then I want you to think about what are some of the things I'm going to indulge in actively, consciously. And so I put these next to the serves me list because I decide I want to indulge sometimes. And so my three favorite things right now is dark chocolate, um, crackers, I am kind of like off the crackers, and popcorn. And so most nights I will have, and I'll walk you through kind of my, how I think about like my day of eating, most nights I will eat a couple pieces of dark chocolate. But it's very different than like, oh, I'm just going to eat all of the things. I'm going to eat all of the chocolate. I decide it very consciously. It's just kind of part of my routine. All right. So uh, before I move on to, before I move on to, I'm going to give you my example. And I do want to say, like, don't think, sometimes I have given people my example and sometimes I don't because sometimes people are like, okay, I'm going to eat exactly like that. Like, I do not want you to do that. I just want you to see like how available it is to you to decide to eat in a way that serves you. So I'm just going to drink some water. Sorry, I think I, I think I've shared before when I used to teach, I was like, <laughs> I forget how like talking takes your, takes your oomph out of your mouth. Okay, so how we think it works. I think so also because so many of us are analytical and so many of us are so used to needing information and wanting information i have to have more information and more information is the answer but here's how we think getting a result in our life works we think okay well at the base i think this is like i call it like a change triangle we think at the base is knowledge we have to like intellectualize all of the things Right? And then from that knowledge, we will start to experiment and we will start to develop an understanding. And then at the very top is our like belief that, okay, well, once I do it, then I'll believe it's possible for me. Once I do it, then I'll believe in myself. And so when we start to kind of practice it and have it solidified in our life, we're like, that only comes after I have all the knowledge, which then turns into understanding and then I'll believe. But that isn't true. And how we know this isn't true is I want you to ask yourself, how many times have you started a program where you're like, okay, I have all the steps, I have all the knowledge, right? And you went to try to do it, but it didn't work. Because it's not about the knowledge. That is not what gets you the result. And now, do you need some knowledge? Yes, but that isn't the most important piece. How it actually works is we need to believe in ourselves, we need to believe in our ability to be able to get there, and then we will start to experience it in our life, and then we will find the knowledge for how to do it. If we don't think something is possible for us, we will never even be able to find the knowledge to be able to do it. And especially when I think about losing weight, how much knowledge do you have? Probably way more than you ever thought you would have about losing weight and weight loss and dieting and all the things, right? Knowledge isn't what gets you there. It's believing in yourself and believing in your ability to get there. And then when you do, especially when you think about it in a way that I'm actually just recording a podcast on this. I'm thinking about like your future self and thinking about 
where you want to be in your future, when you believe it's possible for you to get there, your brain will then go to find all of the understanding and the knowledge to help you get there. So I want you to think about that, especially when it comes to finding and eating in a way that serves you, is how can I believe this is possible for me? And then how would I eat in a way that helps me get there? All right, so here's, I'm gonna give you an example of how I eat, like yesterday. So this is currently, and this changes, by the way, for me. This isn't like, oh, we're good. Here's how I'm gonna eat for the rest of my life. Like this changes for me all of the time. So how, what I want you to do is just write out, and if with the training you will have gotten a worksheet for this, but to just write out, what am I gonna eat and when? And it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm gonna eat the same exact thing every day. Like for example, at 12 p.m. is when I really eat my first meal. Like you might, it might just be vegetables and meat. It might be, I'm gonna eat a big salad with a bunch of vegetables and some, if you like salmon, and some salmon, or whatever it is. But I want you to decide in a way of eating that you could see and answers all of those questions. Is it sustainable? Is it serving me and getting me to my goals? Is it something I enjoy? What would I think about this for a child, right? And maybe we're not, probably not gonna have our children like not eating in the morning. I guess we could, but let's not even go there. So. Anyways, so how often and what you're going to eat is what you're going to write down on this list. So for example, for me, in the morning, I get up anywhere between five and six, and I drink black tea with coconut cream. And that's all I have and a bunch of water. Water should just be like on here. And also, side note, actually, I'm not even going to say that. Okay, so water and coke and tea with coconut cream. And then between 10 and 11, depending on when I'm hungry, depending on how many calls I have or when I have a little break, I will drink a green smoothie. And that's something that we make every week in a batch, it just goes in the freezer and then you pull one out for the next day. And so that for me is very easy and it really serves me in that way. And then around 12 p.m. these past couple of weeks, I've been like really into eggs. A couple of years ago, I hated eggs. So like, again, keep asking yourself like, what serves you? What feels good in your body? So I eat two eggs in coconut oil with avocado and gluten-free toast and a kombucha. Love kombucha. <laughs> my husband is like, this is ridiculous how much kombucha you eat. Like our household drinks because my son also drinks it. But anyways, I love kombucha. And then around 4 p.m., I really like to give myself that break between 12 and dinner. And so if I can go without eating, I won't. But if I'm hungry, and I want to talk about hunger in a minute, because this is not, we're just going to plan to eat, and then if we're not hungry, we're not going to eat, or if we're ravenous, we're not going to eat. So, and then around 4 p.m., this was me a couple of days ago, so sometimes this is just not there. Around 4 p.m., lately, I may have some celery with peanut butter, because my son really likes ants on a log, and, or I might have fruit, and that's just kind of just to help me get to dinner. So we'll come back to the hunger scale in a minute and I'll talk to you about how to use that. And then between 5.30 and 6 is usually when we all sit down to eat dinner and it is almost always meat with a vegetable, stir fry with rice or curry. We make a lot of curries in our house and a lot of vegan curries. So we don't have meat every day. And so you can see like how available it is for you to just decide a way of eating that then can run on autopilot. And then around 8 p.m., four squares of dark chocolate. So I eat dark chocolate pretty much every day. And it's like almost always four squares. Sometimes it's two. And so it depends kind of, but I don't, it's not like, oh, I tell myself I can eat four and I start to eat eight or I start to eat 10. And so this is just deciding how can I eat in a way that serves me, that serves my life, that serves my routine, all of those questions. And then the other thing you're going to do is you're just going to ask yourself, like, how hungry am I? How hungry am I before I eat? And you decide, okay, I want to be about a seven on the hunger scale. Maybe you want to be a five. Maybe you want to be an eight. And you decide that. And then you just ask yourself, like, it comes to, and you, this will start to become so easy. It's just like, it just takes a little bit of practice. But like around 12 p.m., so like today I ate at like 11.15, I was just like really genuinely hungry. And I was like, okay, I'm like a seven. Maybe I would typically wait on another hour, but like I knew I had this call. I have another call afterwards. So I was like, I'm going to eat 
now. And so you just ask yourself, like, how hungry am I before I eat? So if, you, if you've kind of been like, okay, I'm going to try eating at 10, let's say. But if I get to 10 o'clock and I have zero hunger, I'm not going to drink my green smoothie. And there's a few reasons this is so important. I think one of them is that we be, start to become so in tune with our body. We start to really understand our body's hunger cues so that we're able to fuel it in a way that it's ready for. So our body, when it's hungry, is like it's like primed and ready for the fuel. And so really listening to it and giving it that chance without like, I'm just going to eat every two hours because that's kind of what I've decided for me. And allowing yourself to play around with this. And the other thing I want you to think about is if you're someone that's used to eating all of the time. So like for me, when I started this, like I was used to eating like every two hours, like did not want to experience hunger, ate all of the time. For me then to go to like eating like this, it was like my brain would have been like, absolutely not. That is way too far of a stretch. And so what we can find is that when we give our body a break of eating, it helps it to become more fat adapted. And so I'm actually not today going to talk about hormones that you will get that in a video in one of the training videos that you can then use that as information to inform you and make the decision about eating in a way that serves you. But when we give our body that digestive break, we allow it to go to burn its own fat stores, right? And like, if we're trying to lose weight, like that's what we want our body to do. Like we want our body to be very fat adapted, to be able to do that. So it is kind of able to do that all of the time without it really feeling like a burden to us. And so our body is designed to eat, even eat a meal. And like, so when I eat that meal, when I eat at 12 o'clock, my body doesn't use all of that as fuel. It for sure goes and stores some of it and it'll go get some maybe in an hour or two hours. But every time it goes to burn that fuel, it's just so used to it, it's so fat adapted that it's not like, oh, I get this huge hunger cue that I have to try to resist. So I'm gonna stop there for a second. Let me, if you, I saw a couple other people have joined in the last few minutes, so if you have a question, how it works is you type that question into the Q&A, I will respond and we can, we can work from there. So again, like, I don't want you to look at this and be like, this is how I have to eat. Because how, like, when I think about myself eating, like, when I, a couple of months ago, like, I wasn't eating the eggs with gluten-free toast and avocado. And I used to eat a lot more salad in the evening. But right now, like, salad just does not appeal to me. I actually had a salad two nights ago. I was like, that sounds amazing. I've decided I want to eat vegetables with meat salads is vegetables and I had a little bit of meat. And so it's allowing yourself and giving yourself that freedom, but also like very consciously and actively deciding like what food serves me, what food doesn't serve me, because what we're so used to as far as making decisions around food, we're so used to our primitive brain making the decision in the moment. We're like, well, I'll just decide when I'm hungry. And when we're hungry, not only does it turn off the very like intellectual part of our brain, especially if we allow, allow ourselves to get too hungry because all our brain can think about is food and that it needs to eat right now, that we then don't think about our future self. We're so used to that primitive brain that's like, I just want what I want and I want it now and I don't care about anything else. And that part of our brain is like so used to always making the decisions. But when we do it in this way, there's so many things that happen. And one of them is that our human prefrontal cortex, that part of our brain that can plan and think about the future and make decisions, that part of our brain is what is deciding. And that part of our brain is looking out for us and for our best interests and for our future self. And so when we allow that part of our brain to decide and then have that run on autopilot, that is when it becomes so much easier and so much more effortless because then you're gonna decide what food serves me, what food doesn't serve me, what's a way of eating that I can eat in a way that's sustainable, helps me get to my goals, all of the things. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna find yourself, let's say this wasn't in here. So the other thing too is like, I'm breastfeeding. And so there are times that I get like really hungry. And there's some days that I exercise, I move my body most days, 
couple days a week. Sometimes I might not. And sometimes it might be a little more vigorous than other days, but I have no association between exercise and losing weight that I just exercise because I thoroughly enjoy exercise. So then like on a day that I exercise, maybe I really am really hungry at 10 o'clock. And so then I might eat them. And maybe on a day that I'm not, I wait until 11 o'clock. So it's really giving your body back a lot of the power of helping you figure out eating in a way that serves you. I was just going to say something else and I totally forgot what it was. Oh yeah. So then you're going to decide this, right? Okay. Here's how I'm going to eat. You can then also decide what does it look like on a weekday? What does it look like on a weekend? So I typically eat the same way, meaning around the same time, kind of the same types of foods and those foods might change, but kind of the food that serves me. And on the weekend, I will often, um, I might eat this a little earlier, especially if I maybe am hungry earlier. And I will often have popcorn and kombucha while my kids are asleep. And I'm like, it's fun and I like it. And it serves me. Like, and so it's just like, it's just, when I think about it that way, it's, it's something I enjoy. It tastes good. Does it have like a real nutritional reason for me to do it? Like, no, probably not. But I still can stay at my goal weight easily and I don't have this over obsession with food. And it is something I do different on the weekend than during the weekday. So if you're like, well, I eat different on the weekend than I do the weekday, you can do the same exact exercise, but do it for the weekend. Because then you're going to decide. Okay, so let's say you've decided. Here's what I'm going to eat. Here are the times. A lot of people I know have a lot of success with eating just lunch and dinner or lunch and dinner and maybe a little something in the evening. Or, you know, I actually have one client who she eats in the morning before work. She eats a little like a, like a piece of fruit or something in the middle of the day. And then she doesn't really eat until dinner. And so all of that like is available and is an option. And it's just you finding the way that serves you. Because then let's say you've decided let's say this wasn't there. And then let's say around like two o'clock, I'm like, oh, I'm really used to eating. I was really used to in like my corporate job. I, for years, I was like, oh, it's like the afternoon slump. Like I would either, like when I used to drink soda, I would either drink soda or get a coffee. I don't drink coffee anymore either. But like, I was so used to having something then that then it would come this time. And that is when you're going to use the work from last week. And that's when you're going to use the work of processing through the urge and the desire to eat when you're not hungry. And this is so important because you start to process through any emotion and an urge or a desire to eat is an emotion. And so if you want more on that, I want you to either go back to last week's coaching um, group call replay, or you will get more on that in the video series in the training. So that is day four, which is tomorrow. I think you should all get that tomorrow. Um, so you can really see more specifically how to do that. But then you just process an urge and you get really good at really allowing that human prefrontal cortex of your brain to decide how to make decisions for your future. Right? So we've decided how we're going to eat in a way that serves us. We're probably like, amazing, but how do I actually follow through with that? And so here's how we're going to do it. And not only are you going to process those urges and process that desire in the way we talked about that is so much more productive than the typical, like, I need to distract myself, I have to go get tea. Um, <laughs> I was reading your question as I was saying that. Um, so Claire, like the having to go get tea is like part of this because sometimes I was going to say, I have to go for a walk. Like that's what I used to tell myself, like, oh, I can't eat. Like I have to go for a walk that we're trying to distract ourselves so that we don't have to deal with that urge or that desire. But what I want you to do is actually like lean into it and understand it. And so you're going to ask yourself, did I follow through in eating the way I decided I was going to eat? So if I think about that on my kind of like my food decisions of how I'm going to eat. This is the way that serves me of eating right now. Did I follow through? And you're going to ask yourself why or why not? So if then at 8 p.m. I had four squares of dark chocolate, let's say I eat two bars of dark chocolate and then I had popcorn and then I had ice cream and then I had all the things, right? So then you're going to say, okay, I wonder why. 
And you're going to start to ask yourself, like, why did I decide to do that? Not from a place of shame and judgment. Like, we're so used to, like, sitting in self-loathing. And when we self-loathe, it's so uncomfortable for us. And, and we're also not really good at processing that emotion yet. That it turns off our brain's power to understand why and to have that curiosity. Because we're going to understand what's happening for us. And we're going to use the model like we've talked about to understand why we have that over desire. So that what happens is we start to evaluate on the back end, like after we've overeaten, right? Because you're going to decide eating in a way that serves you. You're going to practice processing the urge. You're going to practice processing through the desire. But like the goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to to start to practice it. And there will be times that you eat in a way that didn't serve you and you just want to understand it. So when we have that curiosity, we're gonna ask us like, why did I follow through? Why did I not? Like what was going on for me? And so like, if you think about, for me, I use night eating a lot because that is what I see so often with many women. And that was something that I struggled with. Like, okay, 9 p.m. came around and I had the thoughts, I need to eat something now. And sometimes you don't recognize that as a thought. And so for Claire, for you, when we were talking, this might actually be like um, hunger sensation, right? You might have an actual physical sensation of hunger, let's say, and your brain, and you're like, okay, I need to eat something now, right? Or whatever happens for you. And you really see like, what was I thinking and feeling that then I overate? Or what was I thinking and feeling that then I processed through that desire, that urge and didn't respond to it. And so I think so often the thoughts, I need to eat something now, we're like, that's not really a thought. We, we so often wanna put that in our circumstance line. So if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, our circumstance is something that is something we could prove. We could go to a court of law, everyone would agree on it. Like the, in the, the sentence, I need to eat something now, so many of us believe as a fact. We're like, just reporting the news, I've got to eat something now. But that's not actually true, especially if we're trying to lose weight. Like most of us could go days without eating and our body would be fine. People will go weeks without eating and their body will be fine. And so we feel like I need to eat something now. It feels like a, like such a, like, factual, primal, like kind of urge or desire that we're like, it must be true, right? So, but just like question that. And now if you're at a hunger, let's pretend your hunger sensation is like extremely strong and you're shaky and all of the things, you might have the thought I need to eat something now. And you're like, yep, that's a thought, it serves me. Like I have times like that, that I sometimes let myself get too hungry and I have a thought of like, I need to eat something now and I go and eat. But when we see that like when we're not actually hungry or we just ate or I need to eat more or I want to eat more, like that is what fuels our desire to eat. That is what fuels that, des that urge, that kind of compulsion to eat. Like for me, the desire to eat is a very like, feels like it would kind of like lift me up and take me there sort of feeling, sort of sensation that that we often think like it comes from the fact that it's nine o'clock. It comes from the fact that it's the evening. It comes from the fact that I have stress or anxiety and that's why I want to eat. And so it's really important to understand what are we thinking and how is that fueling our desire to eat? So then it, let's pretend like this is what happens, right? So my action was I ate a bar of chocolate, three handfuls of chips and two portions, a second portion of dinner. And all this does is reinforce my need to eat, my desire to eat. And I don't even give myself the opportunity to process through the desire. So what you wanna do is you wanna look at this of like, okay, here's what happened last night. It was 9 p.m. I had the thought I needed something now. I felt desire. You list in your action line, it's all of the things you ate and your inaction of processing through the desire. And the result that you, that you create for yourself is you prove this true. It becomes this like loop. And this is how it can become so, um, ingrained and feel like it's so solidified in our brain and so all you do is understand this and you start to see like oh i just continually have the thought i need to eat something now because it's nine o'clock so we have about five minutes left so i have we kind of talked about a lot of this 
Um, so if you have any, oops, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A or type the, yeah, put them in the Q&A. That's easier than the chat and I will answer those for you. And so some of the questions I most often get are something like, well, how is this different? Or this feels like it, like it could be restrictive. And the exact opposite is true. And I want you to try it and experience that for yourself because a couple of reasons. You, you first want to write it down and you want to like get it out of your head. I think about for, for those of us that struggle with this, like our head is where the problem is. We want to get it out and just see it and like separate ourselves from it. And then as we practice this, we start to develop this relationship with ourselves, our relationship with ourselves, the relationship with ourself where we can trust and commit and we can honor what we've decided for ourselves. So when I think about eating that way every day, it's like every day I kind of build on that trust and that relationship with myself. Cause I'm like, I said I was going to do this here. We did. We went, to, we went and did it and it runs on autopilot. And then when I maybe do overeat, because like, guess what? There are still times that I overeat, like no longer binging, no longer to the point of being stuffed and like feeling sick, but there are still times I overeat more than like, I'm like, Oh, you know, I ate maybe we actually had ribs. Um, when was that? I don't know, a week ago. And I was like, mm, definitely like I could tell, like I ate maybe like one too many. And so, but then it's like, I get really curious about, I wonder why, like what was going through my mind? Like what was happening? And because I'm not beating myself up, I give myself the opportunity to learn from it and to understand it so that the next time I can see it in advance. And so we start to evaluate after the fact so that then your brain becomes really good at seeing what's happening in the moment so that then it can predict and kind of stop it from happening before it ever even does. And so as we develop this skill, and it really is a skill, then the food can change. And I think when we think about it being restrictive in this way, not only are you deciding, not only are you no longer thinking about, well, this is bad and this is good, and just thinking about, does it serve me? But as you develop this skill, you start to really believe like no food is off limits ever. Like for me, I don't believe any food is off limits for me ever. And so the food I eat might change, but the way I think about it stays the same. And then it doesn't matter where I am because I always get to bring that part of me with me. So for example, I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, my parents have a lake house that we will go to and I have three sisters. And so there are times, two of us live in Wisconsin, two of us live out of, out of the state. And so there are times that my other sisters will come back and we will, let's say we're all there at the house and we all stay there and stay overnight and like, it's a great time, all of the things. And so you saw the way I eat in that I drink my black tea with coconut cream in the morning. I don't typically eat until 10 or 11 when I drink a green smoothie. So I then at the lake house, it's the difference between this so we go and there are times that like someone will make a big spread for breakfast. Let's say there's French toast and sausage and bacon and eggs and orange juice and all the things. There have been times in my life that I've been like sitting at the table with them. Like I can't eat, I can't eat, I can't eat. Like this is terrible, but I really want to. And like having that battle with myself and not eating. So like pushing against it and feeling really restrictive. And now I sit down with them while they're eating and I don't even want to eat. Like it doesn't, it's not a battle. It's not something I have to actively struggle with. And that is the difference as you start to develop this skill. So when you would look at me from an outside perspective, I'd be sitting at the, the same table. I'd be sitting at the house. The same food would be around. The same people would be around. But the energy that it took me to not eat, to do the same action, like both of those versions of me, one was exhausting. Sometimes I would even be like, gotta go guys I'm gonna go for a walk and now I'm like no I can probably sit there talk with them and like my brain doesn't even want to eat because I know it doesn't serve me and that's when it's like magical because then our desire for it is gone and so it's really doing this and developing this skill so I see so Claire said okay so I've had my late afternoon meal and it was really healthy and I asked myself questions such as does this serve me 
and I really enjoyed it, but I think I've eaten too much. Not totally stuffed, but I feel a bit too full. So how do you get the quantity right 20 minutes later or so, so you're not stuffed? Oh, so 20 minutes later, so I'm not stuffed. How can I teach myself to stop eating three quarters of the way through the meal if I'm not yet feeling full? Yeah, so here's the other thing you want to do, is when you're sitting down and eating, when you are thinking about processing through the desire, what you can do is you can like stop halfway through and like ask yourself, like how satisfied am I? I, I used to ask myself, all right, how, how satisfied am I? How satisfied do I want to be? For me, I like to be about like 60% there, not 100% there. 100% to me is like, like when I think about like eating a massive meal and like I can't do anything but lay down. That to me was like binging and just like, or like going to a holiday party and just like eating all the things. Like that to me was that really, really uncomfortable stuff feeling. And so then I, you, again, you start to experiment with it. Like, okay, so I've asked myself how hungry I am before the meal. And then you also start to work on that as you're eating. As like, okay, how hungry am I? And you will experience the desire to keep eating. And so the way you train your, your brain to like eat in a way that serves you as in not overeating is you also process through the desire to keep eating when you're like, I, I intellectually like feel like I have had enough. And there does become a point of diminishing returns as we're eating. So there comes a point when we think about, especially eating something indulgent, of like the first couple of bites, let's say, of a decadent piece of cake, or even for me, like when I eat a couple squares of chocolate, it's amazing. And then you think about if you're eating like three bars of chocolate, how do you feel eating the last bite? The enjoyment from it, it doesn't taste as good. Like that you get, there's a point of like diminishing returns from your enjoyment. So you ask yourself, like, is it worth it to me to keep eating? Like, does that serve me to keep eating? And then you also ask yourself the questions on the back end. And as you start to experience eating and not feeling overly full, it's kind of like in the night when you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, I feel like amazing. And you really like sit with that and memorize, like, how does that feel? And just ask yourself some of those questions so that it can start to run on autopilot. So there was a period of my life that I would like, really intentiously and consciously, and I suggest this in the beginning, actually, like, don't eat with the TV on, don't eat, like, distracted, like, not that no one else can be there, but try not to eat when you're standing, when you're driving, when you're, like, doing all the things that are, become mindless, so that you can really be present while you're eating, and slow yourself down to, like, am I eating in a way that feels good? do I have the desire to keep eating even though I know I won't feel great afterwards? And it is something that you start to practice, but in the same way that you start to feel hunger in a different way, you will start to feel that satiated feeling in a much different way as well. Because as you start to experience eating and not overeating, it will become so much more enjoyable to be in your body. And as you start to respect and honor and trust your body, you love your body in a different way that your desire to overeat goes away. Like my desire now to overeat is like, absolutely not. Like I have no desire for it, even though I used to, but just, it just doesn't feel good in my body. So it takes a little bit of experimenting and really seeing like, again, does it serve me? Does it not serve me? And then also like the quantity that you eat at different times might change, but you're just bringing it back to yourself and your body and like, how do I feel in my body? And that is one of the reasons that I don't think it is beneficial for us to say, well, I'm going to eat like, talk to a woman who had like multiple scale counters and like, we're going to measure all the food and eat all the things in a certain quantity all the time because it doesn't give us that ability to develop that relationship with ourselves and that skill of really being in tune to our body. And that is really what I think about when I think about being naturally thin is eating in a way that serves me and not treating my body in a way that I don't feel good in my own body. So I hope you all found that helpful and I will see you all again next week. So I will 
post this replay for you and you should have started to get some of the video training with the worksheets. So this will be in there so that you can rewatch it obviously on this replay, but you can watch it there and kind of I'll walk you through again how to start thinking about that. And if you have any questions that you didn't ask here or that you want me to talk about or a different topic you want me to talk about, and you either don't feel comfortable asking them here or you want me to answer them at another time or even if you're watching this replay and you can't make these just send me an email and i will be sure to talk through that and we can work through that i hope you all have a beautiful weekend and i will see you all next week